Thank you. Thank you to both speakers. Uh, excellent work. Um, so my name is Christian Guyan Smith. I grew up in Grand Lodge, gradu graduated from MSU in 2010, and I've been working uh, since then on um, creating a sustainable community and farm. Um, I uh, originally got into this because I was into the positive psychology, the positive social psychology of community. Um, increasing anxiety and depression are largely a lack of community in our lives. There's been an increasing anxiety and depression rate in America um, basically since the turn of the century, and social isolation is as dangerous to your health as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, so I originally got into that for the mental, mental and uh, psychosocial well-being of uh, community. But it was uh, after I started to delve into sustainable community development that I realized that it was a way to heal our relationship to the natural world as well. Um, in that time period, I actually started working with land preservation at the county level, uh, with Ingham County, uh, with Barry County, with Kent County. Uh, and what we do is we place permanent conservation easements on farmland and natural land. What we're doing is protecting the land base for future generations to make sure we have enough ecosystem services and enough farmland to support our populations. And I, I am the programs coordinator for Ingham County Farmland and Open Space Preservation, but I will say, uh, because our board director is here, that these, do not, these views do not reflect the um, board uh, or Ingham County. Um, so in my day job, I prevent development. Uh, in my passion project, I show that there is a positive way to develop farmland. And this is our uh, community's name, Sylvan's Neighborwood. Uh, neighborwood because we're showing that we can support our communities through forest ecosystems. And Sylvan is the name of our township uh, just outside of Chelsea, Michigan. Um, I found that in terms of communicating uh, climate chaos to uh, the, the public, about 5% uh, fear and about 95% hope is where its sweet spot's at. Um, but because everyone's coming together for climate change tonight, I'm going to do about 50-50, and I hope all of you uh, can bear with me um, through the really depressing stuff first. Um, and because I'm at the League of, Conserv or League of Women Voters, um, oh, oh yeah, let me just uh, go through a little bit of our... Uh, branding here. We're an ecological community, we're low impact, renewable and off-grid, sustainable, affordable, extraordinary living for common folks. I like that little phrase there, but uh, let's get into uh, climate activism. Greta Thunberg, uh, she's a personal hero of mine, uh, probably the most powerful climate speaker of uh, a generation and currently uh, living. Um, she recently sailed across the Atlantic uh, because she hasn't been flying for years because of the climate impacts of uh, of, fl of flying. Um, this is my favorite quote from her. Adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if your house is on fire because it is. And I think that's a really apt analogy because it a house that is on fire is getting damaged and it's going to take a long time to repair. So even if we started tomorrow radically transforming our society, it's going to take a long time to repair the damages already done to the climate systems and the ecosystems of this planet. Um, I'd like to read a quote from Greta that she gave just a few days ago at one of the climate strikes. You all come to me for hope, how dare you? You've stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words, and yet I am one of the lucky ones. People are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and the fairy tale of eternal economic growth? How dare you? For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear, and you dare to continue to look away, and you come here saying that you are doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are nowhere in sight. With today's emissions levels, our remaining CO2 budget will be gone in less than eight and a half years. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency, but no matter how sad and angry I am, I don't want to believe that, because if you fully understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil. And I refuse to believe that. You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The, A's, the eyes of the all future generations are upon you, and if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now is where we draw the line. The world is waking up, and change is coming whether you like it or not. She chills me every time she speaks. She's much more courageous than I, I am, and I hope to be. But there are plenty of young people rising up across the country. Uh, we've, uh, you know, Marshall will speak a little bit about this in a minute, but the Sunrise Movement, I went down to protest in front of Nancy Pelosi's office with them for the Green New Deal. The Extinction Rebellion also has a startup uh, community group right in Lansing. I encourage you to get involved with both of these. But even if these movements are successful, and I hope they can be, even if we started a Green New Deal tomorrow, 
We still have climate chaos. We are still going to deal with the consequences of hundreds of years of mismanagement of our, of our natural world. So what do, we what do we do? We change our lifestyles. We change the way we live. We change the way we interact with each other, and we change the way we interact with the soil. Even with, because even without climate change, Americans live as if there were five Earths. We consume enough resources that we would need five Earths to support us. We've cut, um, and that's because we, our land use is that we concentrate uh, people into highly dense areas with high fossil dependency. These homes right here are all liabilities, in my mind. Then we concentrate farmland and then use fossil fuels to, just, to produce fuel. We'll get into that in a little bit. And then we leave whatever is left over for nature. That's not how indigenous people lived. Indigenous people integrated all of these things. And we'll show with our development that there's a way to integrate these, use, these land uses into one holistic way of living, one integrated way of living. We uh, cut down all of the natural ecosystems. There's about like 40 acres left of old growth in the Lower Peninsula, I think. Uh, we, uh, we're, we've lost about 50% of the world's topsoil in the last 100 years, still losing lots and lots of topsoil every year um, because of the way that we grow food. Uh, this is aquifer map. Uh, we uh, don't treat our aquifers very well. Uh, Ogallala, uh, big bread basket for the United States, is probably going to go dry by 2030. Uh, and Mexico City is actually sinking inches per year because they're withdrawing so much water. Oroville and Eco Village in India, their primary crisis is saltwater infiltration because of their uh, lack of uh, aquifer uh, withdrawal. This is a biodiversity loss map, up to 60% biodiversity loss across the uh, middle of the country. And uh, this is a huge problem. Uh, this is uh, worsened by climate change, but mostly because of habitat destruction, mostly because of uh, the way we grow food. And uh, this is ecosystem service. This is ecosystem resilience. With, with the number of species in an ecosystem, that is a, a proxy for how healthy that ecosystem is. So we're looking at vast ecosystem simplification across the entire planet, both in the ocean systems and in the and land systems. Uh, and, that, and then the kind of moniker of this is like the honeybee, right? But there's, it's all, actually all species are important, and we need to be preserving as many natural lands as we, ha we have left. Um, so Michigan is incredibly important. And I think that this is a proxy for water stress. This is a, a basically population times uh, water withdrawals of aquifers and fresh water uh, uh, pred predictions into 2060. Blue is good, everything else is bad. The primary thing that we're going to be dealing with, the primary climate impact in Michigan, is going to be climate refugees. I think that we are the most blessed bioregion in the entire world. We have 21% of the world's fresh water, and we're talking about positive impacts of climate change. So we're going to be seeing people moving from these dark red areas into the light blue. But with great power becomes great responsibility, and we need to be prepared for millions of people coming into our area over the course of my lifetime, and certainly Greta's. And if you look into where should I move for climate change, Michigan's always at that top of that list. And here's just from three or four days ago, 538, uh, the best place to move, move if you're worried about climate change, Michigan. <laughs> so the folks are coming, and I say, let them come. We will help them. It's either conflict or cooperation, and I choose cooperation. So let's prepare our land base for increasing populations with regenerative support systems. So we have 21% of the world's fresh water. What are we going to do? We're going to not use fossil fuels, obviously, um, but also use vastly less energy. So when, I, when you think about five Earths, think about using 15% of the resources that you use just across the board. And another way of thinking about that is using only 15% of your annual income. We have a vast reduction in resource consumption as a, as a culture. Because this right here is the green energy revolution, this little blue line up here. And it's just added to energy use. And of course, line five in the, uh, under those straits, that's, to me, that's, this is because I drove here. Like, I, 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 you know, I like blaming Enbridge, and it's, it's nice, but this is because I'm continuing to use fossil fuels. I create the demand for this. And this was the second, this is Kalamazoo River. This is the, the, now the second. It used to be the first largest oil spill in the, in the inland uh, uh, United States. 
<coughs> so let's stop using fossil fuels. Um, also, uh, yeah, and, and basically if you get off fossil fuels, it's more resilient because the 2008 economic collapse uh, was basically because of high oil prices. And this is a study showing that economic recessions track almost uh, solidly with uh, oil pricing. Um, but oil price also tracks with food because it takes 10 calories of fossil energy to produce every one calorie of industrial crop. So we're essentially eating fossil fuels. 50% of the protein in your body is made from methane, fracked from the earth. So about, as a proxy, about half the population of the earth is being supported by fossil subsidy that we're losing really quickly. So we need to figure out a way to grow food without fossil fuels. And this is just a, oh, this is actually a work at MSU showing uh, oil pricing tracking with food. Um, okay, just real quick, uh, the um, North Atlantic Current uh, brings a bunch of heat from the tropics to Europe. That's why, you know, Europe is approximately the same latitude as Canada, but is as warm as the rest of the United States, right? That's because a lot of heat is coming up from the tropics. Well, with, with Greenland melting, there's a bunch of fresh water going into the ocean and shutting down this current. Theoretically, this could shut down in the next few decades, and if that did, it would plunge Europe into a mini ice age and perhaps collapse the global economy. So we need to prepare our communities and our state for being locally self-sufficient and, re and re re resilient, reliant. Um, so how did indigenous people do it? Well, they did agriculture with nature. You know, settlers came over and said that the Native Americans were too primitive for agriculture, but they were actually preferentially planting fruit and nut trees across entire ecosystems to support a higher care and capacity for their population. And we need to do something similar. We, we need to work with agroecological systems and not clear cut what's there, but work with what's there to increase the care and capacity of the land. So the, one way of thinking about it is we need to move from fossil culture to forest culture, because that's what people were doing in this, that's what Anishinaabe people were doing in this state before we came along and just plowed down and started pumping a bunch of fossil fertilizer onto the ground. Um, so this is New Forest Farm uh, in Wisconsin, restoration agriculture. Um, this is a type of silvo pasture. Silvo is tree, Latin root for tree, pasture. So combining livestock with forest systems with so uh, fruit and nut trees. And he's got 100 acres there and he says that he's producing 17% more calories per acre than corn. I think instead of Elon Musk and all these billionaires spending a bunch of money trying to get to Mars, like a little kid, you need to take care of your first planet first before you get another one, right? <laughs> so this is the moonshot. How many calories per acre can we get without fossil inputs? That's what we all should be critically engaged in. <clears throat> okay, so this guy uh, is Eric Tainsmeyer. He wrote The Carbon Farming Solution and actually consults with the UN. He lives in Massachusetts. This is his eighth acre, a little homestead in an urban area. He's got over 200 different edible and medicinal plants in an eighth acre. 200 different edible and medicinal plants, including kiwi, hardy kiwi from, from Russia, and including mushrooms and aquaculture in the back. We've got a great local example with Mike Hogue. Lily House Permaculture, go visit, it's great. He's got over 200 edible crops in his eighth acre lot too, and he'll give you some starts to go bring them back to your, lo to your lot. Um, and he's just a wealth of knowledge. Definitely go visit that. Um, but so people are coming together to um, change the way they live because doing it on your own, that's you know, Mike's full-time job is managing his land and teaching people about it, right? But we all can't do that, so let's come together in community and build systems together. So eco-villages, as they're sometimes called, I just like it to call it sustainable communities, but have been popping up across the country for the last 50 years. You know, eco-village Ithaca, Dancing Rabbit eco-village, on Missouri, um, but we need examples that are proximal outside of urban areas where people can access the knowledge, the systems, the plants, and bring them back to their, their home. So we're only a mile outside of Chelsea. So that's part of the reason I partnered with my business partner is because we are right in the midst of the population instead of being out in the middle of, out in the middle of nowhere. So we formed inlandish development, instead of outlandish, inlandish. You bring resources locally, create resources locally. Uh, and we are a development company that will be in, uh, focused in regenerative food, energy, water, and community. We got positive impact goals. I'm going to try to keep going along more quickly here. Um, 
But basically with this slide, I'm basically saying that Sylvan's Neighborwood is our first community, and I'm already in talks with other groups of homeowners that would like to start other communities like the one we're doing in Chelsea. So whether or not you're interested in moving to Chelsea, we want to talk to you about transitioning your homestead or transitioning you know, your group of uh, neighborhood uh, homes or starting another intentional community on land that you, you and a group of homeowners has picked out. We'd like to see uh, you know, an ecological community like this next to every population center across the state so we can transition Michigan to a uh, regenerative uh, culture. So Sylvan's Neighborhood, uh, it's not uh, too different than a homeowners association. In fact, it'll probably function as a home homeowners association. It's just that we co-own an agricultural business together. One of the first questions I get asked is like, do I have to work in the farm? How many hours? Well, if you're a, bit, a business investor, do you have to work in the business? No, not, not necessarily. So some people will be working in it, but um, everyone will be a co-owner of that farm business. So this is Chelsea, Michigan. We got Waterloo Recreation Area, the largest uh, uh, preserved forest land in the Lower Peninsula. That's downtown Chelsea. Chelsea's pretty great, not too far from Ann Arbor. Um, this is what conventional development looks like on farmland. This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is what conventional rural development looks like. This is also pretty bad. Like this is a bunch of prime soil and we got these large lots. People think large lots preserves more land. No, it just takes more land out of agricultural production. So you get a snake uh, driveway down the middle. You could take all these homes and cluster them nice and community oriented right down towards the road and then have all that prime soil preserved for farming as it should be. So, this is our site here. Just to give a little context here, we're a mile outside of Chelsea. So a little bike ride. And we got 22 acres. And that's all prime soil, so what do you do? You cluster the homes near the road, you make the lots nice and small and community oriented, and you have the concentrated agriculture in the back. We also integrate agriculture. So everyone who wants to will be doing agriculture on their individual lots, right? but then have a commons area, an edible park commons area that will serve as picnic area and also a nursery for every edible and medicinal plant that can grow in our climate system. Um, so these are some of the system, agricultural systems, nursery, like I said, of every, every uh, edible and medicinal plant that uh, could theoretically grow in our warming climate. Uh, silvo pasture, again, combining livestock with fruit and nut orchard. We hope to eventually install a dairy, although it's relatively expensive. Um, we might have to go with outside financing for that. So 16 residences will actually probably be looking more like at 14 residences. But things change all the time. But we're still working with the township and the county on some of the ordinance changes right now. Right now, the land is just in pasture. This is some of our community guidelines. And this is actually what I would suggest any community stick to in terms of being regenerative. Cluster your homes, limit your home size, Composting toilets, you know, Americans don't like to deal with their shit, but we're gonna need to in order to heal ourselves and our planet, right? So, composting toilets decrease water use, as in zero water use, uh, and build soil. Uh, gotta capture those poo trans. Um, our homes... Poo trans? Yeah. <laughs> um, so our homes are off-grid and require renewable energy and good insulation. Residents co on and buy into the farm and share costs and profits. Um, let's go. So we want to design the site with our residents. I like the idea of a community uh, cluster with a edible park commons area, but you know, govern, you know, community governance is hard but useful, and we'll come up with a better design together. Um, let's see, moving on, ecological housing, heritage, quality, generates its own energy, stores more carbon than it emits, creates no wastes, uses natural materials where possible, minimizes lifetime costs, and safer for residents and communities. My favorite is straw bale construction. Who's heard of straw bale construction? Oh, this room is so cool! Okay, <laughs> normally it's way less than that. Um, this is Joe Trumpy, the good Trumpy, um, and he... <laughs> He is a University of Michigan professor, and he built a straw bale off-grid home um, in Grass Lake, not too far from our community land. Um, this is his home right here. Uh, next week, uh, yeah, next week is the solar home tour for Lansing. He's done a solar home tour for uh, Chelsea area. Go 
see it, it's amazing and beautiful. Um, he helped, he basically built this himself outside of the framing with him and his family. Um, but straw bale forms the wall insulation. And instead of fossil foams, we're having to draw more fossil fuels out of the ground and then use that for our homes. We can use straw bale um, and they're just thicker walls. And it's like putting a big wool blanket over your house. And then you have an earthen plaster that's very nice. This is uh, heated just by wood. We don't, we can't heat with methane anymore, right? So it's passively heated from the sun because it faces the south. We should have all of our homes facing the south. They knew this, uh, Socrates knew this. Like 2,000 years ago we knew it and we kind of forgot about it because of our fossil subsidy. Um, and then, uh, so he, he uh, heats with a wood gasifier and pumps the heat into his uh, uh, floor with um, radiant floor heating. Um, and he's off-grid, completely off-grid with uh, golf cart batteries. This is a bunch of different straw bale homes. Um, they can, you, can, you, you might walk by a straw bale home and not even know it. Um, and this is one in Poland that was built for like 8,000 bucks. If we didn't have a bunch of uh, you know, restrictive uh, coding, we could build something that cheap, but uh, likely not. Um, but homes can also look very unique and they can be round. Um, they can have like a nice adobe. This is a little experimental structure we did on our site with earth bags. Basically just pump earth into a plastic bag and this is a little tool shed we did. Um, but uh, eventually it will be covered in earth um, so that it can be much more aesthetic than what it is already. Um, so tiny homes are great. Uh, tiny homes are illegal. You know, uh, sustainable living is kind of illegal in our country. Um, but uh, so, uh, you know, most townships have a thousand square foot minimum. We're working with our township to decrease that. Um, uh, but they can look very beautiful. Uh, this is an attached greenhouse. Um, this is a very cheap uh, AI dome, uh, very well insulated, although it's fossil materials. This is a straw bale home, not home, it's a straw bale artist residence in Michigan. You can do earth burning with it, which is pretty cool. This is rice hull insulation, so you blow rice hull instead of blown cellulose into your walls. Um, it's an agricultural waste product, uh, do, does really good with uh, moisture. Um, Deanne Bednar, super amazing woman, like Greta uh, Thunberg, she is badass. And she uh, is in Oxford, Michigan, and can come and build like these homes with a community. This is a straw bale home, but th this is highlighting thatch and green roofs. This is her hobbit sauna, she calls it. And this is the thatch roof that she brought in a thatcher from, um, who was originally born in England. And she helped us, uh, so Phragmites is an invasive species, and you can, instead of, uh, okay, my time's up, I'm gonna keep going for a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, so thatch. Uh, so thatch, thatch roof is really uh, uh, useful, it's very highly insulative. This is us collecting some down the road. Um, this is in uh, Charlevoix, Michigan, the mushroom houses, they can be very aesthetic. Um, and then sustainable heating and cooking, uh, uh, ther thermal mass, uh, high efficiency stoves can store heat like a battery. Um, we need to be growing our own fuel. Um, Chris McClellan is working with us, he works with Mother Earth News. But uh, basically all of your um, uh, wood, all of your home fuel can grow on your site. You can grow your own heat. Um, and uh, did you know that when you cut down a tree, you don't have to kill it? Just cut it down when it's dormant in the winter. It's called coppicing and it'll regrow from the roots. It's the most sustainable form of uh, fuel wood that we have. And it's actually older than monocrop agriculture. They were doing it in Europe, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, and then Leslie Science Center has composting toilets, like I said, and it, uh, <laughs> Three minutes. Give me three minutes. Uh, well, we need to do question and answers for get okay. a hurry break, okay? Okay. And then I'll buy you a drink later. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to compress two hours into 20 minutes, okay. like I normally do. Come, on. Come talk to me afterwards, and we'll uh, I'll show you the rest of the slides. Okay. <laughs>